I haven't done a show in a long time, and I was interested in doing this show, Freedom from Government, in which I'm going to describe the things that I have done to make a foundation I can argue from that would give me some freedom from uh, government enslavement. So the first thing we're going to have to do is look at our own belief systems. Our belief systems are what they say they are, BS. They're just crap. The belief systems limit us from thinking that we're fully free. And it's only if we express ourselves that we're going to have any freedom in this world. First thing that you're going to have is uh, knowledge. Knowledge is power. And if you don't have any knowledge, then you can't stand on a... a, a statement that you're going to say is true because you've never read the truth of the statement that you're standing on. Your status and standing are very important. So to get an idea of what your status and standing is, you have to understand that your rights came from your creator. They came from God. They didn't come from man. Man doesn't give you your rights. If my rights come from another man, then uh, he can also take those rights away from me. So I recommend you watch David Strait's five-part series uh, that he did in Utah that's available on YouTube at Radiant Beans YouTube channel. And you'll find that it's an interesting watch, and he has a lot of interesting things to present there. It's well worth the watch. There's a different stages in this learning game of the Great Awakening, because we're all waking up across the country. This is a biblical thing. Nobody made it up. At least not on this earth anyway. But uh, we know exactly what's going to go on, approximate time frames, and what's going to happen. And right now we're in a an exciting time to be alive. The next thing I would watch is Bunny Speakman. Uh, she did this uh, presentation back in the late 80s and early 90s absolutely excellent stuff you got to watch it and take notes because she outlines a lot of the fraud that's going on in the country today and how they started changing the rules of inheritance and rights and how your rights are inherited and change them into trusts where you don't have an estate that's inheritable so the first thing that I would have you do is get a authenticated certificate of live birth, C-O-L-B. Not the birth certificate, that's a short form, but they're going to call this the long form, and you may have to go to vital records in order to get a copy of it. Okay, all this information is from Jonah Bay. The Minnesota Rules of Court, Rule 220, Birth Certificates. The Register of Titles is authorized to receive for registration of memorials upon any outstanding certificate of title an official birth certificate pertaining to a registered owner named in said certificate. Well, that would be you, the baby. Of the title showing the date of birth of said registered owner, providing there is attached to said birth certificate an affidavit of an affiant who states that he or she is familiar with the facts recited, I guess that would be the informant, stating that the party named in said certificate is the same party as one of the owners named in said certificate. Well, that wouldn't be the informant. And was thereafter the registrar of title shall treat said registered owner as having attained the age of majority at a date 18 years after the date of birth shown by said certificate. So I'm going to claim I'm the sole owner to the certificate of title, and then it's my baby footprints that are on there, and I'm the owner. Here we can see in 28 U.S.C. 1733 government records in Section B, properly authenticated records shall be admitted in evidence equally with the originals. So when you have an authenticated copy, you're the holder in due course of the original document. So to get an authenticated uh, certificate of live birth, a COLB, you're going to need to first get a certificate of live birth that's certified by the county in which you were born in. And just call them up and ask them if they have a certificate of live birth for you. If not, you may have to go to the vital records and demand a certificate of live birth from them. But you want that instead of a birth certificate. Once that is certified, 
then you're going to apply to the Secretary of State of your state, the state you were born in, to authenticate that certificate. Then you're going to have to send a cover letter and tell them which country you need the authentication for. It's either an apostille or an authentication. And uh, I picked Taiwan because that's a country where you could get authentication for and sent it off to the Secretary of State of California. Once you get your birth state Secretary of State to send you back the two forms, the certificate of live birth and the authentication of the, of the notary stamp on that, you're going to send it off to the federal government with a form 4194 as shown and demand a authenticated copy of that certificate of live birth. So the blue uh, outlined document is a certificate of live birth from the county of San Francisco and then the next document is the Secretary of State Alex Padilla's document and you notice he put a red stamp across both documents that's to show that they're the same and then the last document is the Department of State by uh, Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State, authenticating that document. So if you want to read the written instructions that I have on uh, from Jonah Bay on authenticating your certificate of live birth, here they are. You can just hover over the page and stop it and read it and move on. But it's a pretty good explanation of some of the things that are going on here. The birth certificate is a way of them controlling you just like the social security is a way of controlling you and those two instruments are pretty strong at identify they're using them to identify you and to control you so the next thing you can do while you're waiting for your certificate of live birth authenticated copy is to do a, a revocation and termination of your voter registration you don't want to vote nothing you vote for is going to make any difference so if but if you vote for a representative then you're subject to all the laws that they pass and you don't want to be a member of the body politic this is from the social security administration online what are the trust funds and they are identifying that there are two trust funds great because that means you are the beneficiary of a trust fund you're going to need to learn about trusts because trusts are the best way to hold property. And if you watch this uh, show that Sui Juris YouTube channel has on trusts, it'll be a good introductory show describing how trusts work. Later, I'm going to show you how to make your own trust. So here I'm making my own, basically an ID that has a bunch of different statements in it that are almost all related to rebutting presumptions that a government official might make over me. Like, I'm not a 14th Amendment United States citizen. I'm a national from the state of California. I'm not a uh, incompetent to handle my own affairs. I have uh, gold and silver, so I'm not uh, a pauper. And the reason for that is because under the Articles of Confederation, they actually state in there that a pauper has no rights. So a person without money has no rights. So we're going to make up this document and then we're going to mail it off to about eight or ten people, the important people, <laughs> the President of the United States, the Attorney General, the Secretary of the Treasury, and the House Speaker, and then we're going to do the same for California. And we're going to put on our document that you have to see Exhibit 1. And here's an example of Exhibit 1. You can pause these and read them. And they're all of the proofs for the, that substantiate my averment. If I don't have any proofs to substantiate my averments, my declarations, my statements, then there's just my opinion. But if I have other people whose opinion are substantiating my opinion, then they're going to have to come up with something else that's going to controvert those claims. And that's going to be difficult for them, and they won't do it basically. That's my experience is they never controvert my claims. The next piece of advice I want to give you is you have to study the law and God created the law that's the highest form of law. The highest form is God's law and it's in the Bible. This country was founded upon the Bible so if you have a little Bible verse in there and go as Jesus did I'm following God's law and I'm following man's law. Next, we study the man's law. So you're going to study the Magna Carta. Just read through it. Read the Magna Carta. 
And then you want to read the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution for the United States of America, and your state's constitution. If you're not going to read the constitutions, you're not going to be able to state that the constitution's laws are higher than any statutory codes that are created. So a lot of people make assumptions that the judge, the policeman, the legislature, they all know what you've done and what the paperwork you filed is. But they don't. Unless you actually give it to them, they have no idea what you've done. So to be fair, just imagine that you've got a black robe on and that you're sitting up there. And if, and if you don't know anything about what I've done, then how are you going to judge accordingly? So here's the California uh, federal government extends the enforcement date for real ID. And let's look at what it takes to get a real ID. This is with your driver's license. Your driver's license becomes your real ID. You need a birth certificate and a social security number. Both of those instruments are not to be used for identification purposes. But let's look at what else they would like to have you put in. Proof of residency. What is residency? What is residency? And why would you need a letter showing that you got a bill from the power company to prove that you are a resident? Okay? Because that's the definition of resident. Not a man who's dwelling within the boundaries of the state of California. Uh-uh. Somebody who's getting a bill. That bill could be going to a trust for all you care, for all they care. It doesn't prove anything. All three of these instruments, the cops look at it like it's a life and death thing to get that state-issued ID from you. And if you give them a homemade ID, which is identification, which I've done, which was notarized, the cop actually turned to me and said, well, you could have faked that. Oh, my God. I could have faked a notary's uh, signature and stamp. Uh-huh, sure. Anyway, this is what real ID is. It's, it's always taking things that aren't meant to be used for identification purposes and using them for that. And what's a resident? Well, look at what the term res means. It means a thing or a matter. So a thing is identified. Yeah, you're the thing that is identified. That's what a resident is. So the next thing I did was I applied for a passport as a state national. And here you can see John Kerry is actually testifying, which means it's under oath, to all this stuff. And you can see down here where he says that they issued a passport to the upper and lowercase name. That's not uppercase, that's the upper and lowercase. However, when I get the passport, it's all in uppercase. And let's look at the passport for a minute. At the top, I typed in c 3 C three page explanatory statement on the top there. You can see my social security is in zeros. And the gal that has all the red writing on it, that's the State Department writing C A. Because they want like they're gonna pretend that I'm in the state of C A instead of California. They only give you enough space there to write in C A, so you have to actually write it on there with your you know, your printer. You have to actually print it on there that it's California. And then this is a mailing address, and since they allow a post office box, I would use a post office box instead of an RFD, but, you know, that's up to you. Here you can see the State Department actually put in, they actually put in my rescinded and revoked driver's license as identification. And because I was using uh, my partner testified that she knew me for uh, more than the th three-year requirement or whatever you know, 10 years, and that they weren't going to accept her statement that I identified me. They're going to use the state-issued ID, right? Then you get down to the uh, explanatory statement at the bottom there at where you sign it, and I'm going to show you why Copper Moonshine Stills is not a decent system here unless it's modified. So the sworn signature on the applicant's legal signature is underneath this statement that I declare under penalty of perjury the following. One, I am a citizen or non-citizen national of the United States and have not blah blah blah. Okay, which one are you? Because they're, they're both means the same thing. When you look at the Immigration and Naturalization Act, that's the lower one that I'm highlighting, you'll see in A21, you are the, the term national means a person owing permanent allegiance to a state. Does it say anything about having allegiance to the United States? No. And if you have allegiance to a government, you're subject to that government. Number 22, 
The term national of the United States means A, a citizen of the United States, or B, a person who, though not a citizen of the United States, owes permanent allegiance to the United States. They're both United States citizens, okay? So you can't have that statement uncorrected, and the way to correct it is with the explanatory statement, which is an affidavit explaining why you're not a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen. Next, the uh, certified copy came back with copies that were so crap they should be embarrassed. I mean, they didn't put the actual one that I put in, the DS-11 I put in, through a copy machine. Oh, no. They blued it out, and they made it Im almost impossible to read and not uh, re readable. But anyway, above my signature, it says, All Rights Retained, comma, non assumpsit 28 U.S.C. 1746, which means without the United States. Non-assumption means I'm not consenting to honor this contract, basically. And then you can see below that I put C3 page explanatory statement annexed. And I also put it on the bottom of the page. And then at the top of the next page, I also put C3 page explanatory statement. And next to my name, I typed in state, in parentheses, citizen slash national, INA of 1952, section 101, a21. So there, if there's any doubt about what my claims are, it's actually written on this document that John Kerry certified as a true and correct copy. Then you go into your parents, they're going to be not U.S. citizens, and your permanent address, yeah, right, like anybody has a permanent address, maybe somebody else thinks I'm God too, but I'm not immortal, so there's no such thing as permanent address. And it's not domiciled in the United States, District of Columbia, or its territories. They accepted it, so guess what? It's doable. And then we go to the bottom where it's a C3 page explanatory statement. So you can read this, you know, pause it and read it. I just, I put this information in. I would do it better today than I did it back then, but it's good enough. I'm making the claim I'm not a pauper, I've got a silver, and that I'm not a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen, and I'm replacing the sworn statement with my own declaratory statement, because otherwise they're going to take my statement. There, thumbprint and an RFD address, and I got it notarized, and it's done. So this is the justification for using an explanatory statement. Susan Blinko here shows that you can't cross terms out on the DS-11. They won't accept it if you cross terms out. But you can attach a, an explanatory statement, and then you can make any affidavit statements that you want, and it'll be put into the record with your stuff. I thought, oh wow, brilliant. When I went in to get my Social Security, I put in an explanatory statement affidavit proving I was a state national and not a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen. I might be a U.S. citizen for some circumstances, but not a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen. They accepted it, they put it in the record, they gave me a stamped copy, and off we go. Uh, so the uh, State Department refused to give me this certified copy for a while, and then they refused to give me the three-page explanatory statement that was annexed to it, even though it says right on the document it's annexed to it. I had to go down to the Cal the, my California uh, congressman and have him pressure the State Department to give it to me. And after a year of pressuring him, they still refused. And what they did, actually, the State Department made fake IDs for me by misspelling my name. Even though I got a certified copy where my name was spelled correctly, the passport and the passport card were not spelled correctly, much less the style of all caps was there. So it took the congressman to force them to give me another passport with the correct name on it. They wanted me to redo my DS-11, which would have been a nightmare because they'd already accepted it the way it was, and I wasn't going to redo it. Notice in the style manual, you can be a Californian. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen. Californian. The next thing I want to bring up is uh, you want to go on. You want to trace your ancestry back because you're an heir to an estate. And your estate was created by your forefathers, your genealogy. So you can go on Ancestry.com and look up your heirs for free for a, on a limited scale. And then when you have uh, hints, you want to research all those hints as they're going to help uh, flesh out your genealogy. You want to go back on both sides of your family to as far back as you can get. If you can get back to the Civil War, great. 
The last thing I'm going to uh, talk to you about is doing a name change. To do a name change, you're going to go to probate court and apply for a name change. And the name that you're going to be changing is all the various uh, all capital letter names that they use for you. They record your property in the all capital letter names, your driver's license, all the other stuff. Even if your and if your name is upper is all capital letters on your birth certificate, certificate of live birth, they'll change that too, and you'll get a new certificate of live birth showing the correction of that. What it's going to do is going to separate you, the living soul, from that uh, fictional corporate commercial entity, and they're going to lose all control over uh, uh, taxing you and assuming that you have a liability to follow the codes as long as you're not breaking any common law crimes like you know rape stealing uh, assault those are the things that you're not going to get out of by claiming sovereignty or having a name change but if you're doing it where you're suffering all the codes that they're uh, throwing at you then you can get out of that by doing a name change and I have friends who have done it and it's been very effective for them that's all I can say about it. So the two things that are publicly recorded documents that I can think of are the uh, passport. If you do a passport application and the Secretary of State accepts that you're not a 14th Amendment citizen, there you go, publicly recorded and accepted by the Secretary of State for the United States of America. The other thing is this uh, name change thing, where you're going to go to probate court and get your name changed back to your upper and lower case name and remove all of those uh, entities that they're using against you. And if somebody tries to use those entities against you, my friend, what she does is she just says, you're in contempt of court. Brilliant. So there you have publicly recorded. The only other public uh, recording ways you can do things is to get a county recorder's office to record an affidavit. And they won't do that in California, but they'll do it in other states. And you can go down and have your stuff recorded in Arizona or some state that accepts affidavits. And you can record your affidavits there and then get certified copies of them. And then they become f full faith and credit for the rest of the United States. They become acceptable as publicly recorded. Then you have the second way is uh, if you have an open court case, and all court cases are open till the end of time. That's the way they are. You can always file things into a court case that you have, and that is a publicly recorded document. Now, sometimes they're going to seal them so that other people can't see them, but you filed it in and get a certified copy out, and that's public recording. Tell you why it's different. Go ahead, Trial. Okay. You've got three different branches of the government tree. You've got the executive, you've got the judicial, and you have the legislative, okay? The legislative side is the sovereign side. It is above the Constitution. In order to get over to the legislative side, you have to go to probate, okay? The legislative side is the side that protects you and recognizes the trust. <clears throat> in order to get the trust and take possession and control of the trust, you have to execute the name change. The name change that you're changing it from is the capital version of your name to the upper lower version of your name. When you do that and you come in with your certificate, they will take the certificate and they will put it on the record as you having arrived or shown up. When you arrive or show up, they will give you a decree. A decree is a divine order. It's an equitable judgment. It is equity. The equity is specifically for the beneficiary of that trust. Okay? What this does is this puts a shield around you, your property, your house, your name, anything that your name is on. So if you, if when you do this, let's say you're in the middle of a foreclosure, or you got court cases or whatever that's going on, once that decree hits the record, they will automatically see that. They will recognize that your cases will be discharged. You are not subject to arrest. You are not subject to search and seizure. When you get your decree, you change your um, registration over to the upper lower name, and they're going to say, oh, well, we can't change it in our system, blah, blah, blah. 
when they get that decree, they will put it in the back end of their system. Now, it's not going to show up on the front end, but it's going to show up in the back end. And I know this because I've done it. And I've done some pretty amazing things that other people <laughs> would have gotten incarcerated for. Okay? Once you get that change, you put everything under that new name. When you go to the court and you look up that docket, it's going to say new name on it. And I got this from Revelations in the Bible. Now, everything I do, I look it up in the Bible, and then I look it up in their codes, and I match it, and then I execute If I don't find it in the Bible, I don't touch it. And that is what has saved me so far. My bank account, for some reason... Even if it's at a low, um, uh, a, a low balance in my card, a high charge will automatically hit my card and then it will zero itself out periodically, okay? Your name is fully protected. As long as you stick to that name, you change your license to that name. Now, my license was under the all capital letter name, okay? And it was revoked, and it was suspended, and it was all this and all that. But I could walk into any rental car office and rent a car with it. And it shows up on their system as it being good. Okay? My mother... The, the re I'm the, sorry, go ahead. The reason you lost that belligerent name. That's right. Because I was not voluntarily using their lease. It's a lease. Yeah. You're you're leasing that name. That name is in position of your name until you come back and put your name on that record. Until then there is no record of you existing. You don't exist. You were never born and therefore they gave you a name to use in commerce and they are whooping your ass for using it. Mm -hmm. This is how you get that protection. It's going to be under the legislative side. If you go look up legislation le legislative, it's going to show you it's sovereign. Okay. Uh, You're not getting Tyrell. executed on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tyrell, are you are you on the do not stop, do not detain? Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, good. Mm -hmm. That's first. Congratulations. Absolutely. They went they went to evict my mother, and I kept trying to tell her that she didn't have to leave because my name was on that lease, and she wouldn't listen. So I ended up going and talking to one of the superior court clerks, and she says, "How did the eviction go?" And I said, "Well, we left." She says, "Why? You didn't have to. The name protected you." And I said, I know that, but my mother was scared. Anywhere okay. you touch, anywhere you step, anywhere you go is protected <coughs> because of that name. Okay, um, I will just tell you this real quick. Um, I've, I've told Seawolf this before. Um, I know a man that was 20-year law enforcement, retired, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is what he said. Um, anytime we pull someone over, and it comes up on the computer screen in red letters, do not stop, do not detain. We don't dare F with those people. That's how he put it. He said, we That's don't right. dare F with those people. That's right. He said, he said we just bid them a farewell day. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is change your name to proper grammar. Your name is an <coughs> all cap. You see the all capital name, you're, they're dealing with your warning, your nom de guerre, and they know you haven't done the deed. Yeah. In addition to getting your petition for your, a name change from the probate court, you are going to add your affidavit, like your uh, Notice of Liability Act of State that has all your claims on it into it, and you're also going to add your authenticated birth certificate. And on the back of the authenticated birth certificate, you want to write in pen and sign it that you are the sole owner and beneficiary of this instrument and any instruments that are made deriving from this instrument. The next thing I think that's really important is learning the law. And if you're not going to be the belligerent claimant and make your rights known to them, then you're going to get kicked around a lot and you're not going to get any joy at court. If you're going to challenge the authority of the government, you're going to end up in court. So you had better experiment with going to court and understand how to go to court and how to press your case. If you don't do this, it's going to be a real problem for you later because you can't really have an attorney and get any joy. So you're going to have to know the procedures that are going to be required to go to court.